Hey YouTube, World Harvest is Plenty. Thanks for stopping by to check out the video. Please don't forget to hit that thumbs up or like button for me. So I've been talking about it and here it is. Islam's connection to the occult world, Freemasonry, Gnosticism, magic, and a whole bunch of other stuff that you guys will be amazed to find out. Now, uh, part one of this will be basically just on Gnosticism. Um, if you don't like anything that you see in part one or you're not interested in Islamic connection to Gnosticism, skip to part two, skip to part three. I will admit these videos will be long because there's a lot of information that will be covered. Um, and this will be hopefully a resource guide for you guys. Um, also, another thing that you will find is that most, uh, pretty much all of the world religions stand in opposition to Christianity and the deity of Jesus Christ. So that should tell you something. Um, I have some information for you right here uh, before we jump into it. This is from uh, a Freemasonic website. This is their sources. Um, so I'm not making any of this stuff up. And let me just read something to you guys and then we're going to jump right into it. Uh, let me blow it up so you guys can read it too. It says here, the origins and expansion of Freemasonry in the Middle East. Early connections to the Sufi orders. Now remember, this is a, a Freemasonic website. It says the history of Freemasonry in the Middle East dates back to the 18th century when European travelers and scholars began to draw parallels between the Masonic lodges and the Sufi orders of the Islamic world. I think it goes further back than that, but that's what they put on their site. It goes on to say the Sufi orders, which are mystical branches of Islam, share some similarities with Freemasonry in terms of their initiation ceremonies, the hierarchical structures, and emphasis on the brotherhood and spiritual development imagine that so let's jump in guys enjoy and may good lord may the good lord continue to bless you and your family i i had been introduced to this brother's material over a year ago and i was astounded at the stuff he's researched specifically the gnostic influence on islam and islam's influence on masonry i can tell you without exaggeration he's one of the most well-read well-informed, well-educated authorities on what I would call the mystical aspect of Islam and its ties with what we call secret societies. The man is a blessing to the Church of Jesus Christ. He is a gift to Christians because he's done in-depth studies and in Islamic sources as well as in the Talmud. A lot of people may not know. You've studied the Talmud thoroughly and with that said, Maybe you can give us a little introduction of your background. Who are you? Are you even a Christian? And what got you interested in studying Islam on this deep level, as well as your knowledge about the Talmud? Because you did sessions with Adam Seeker, where you also broke down some of the statements found in the Talmud and how they're misrepresented. So, brother, who are you? Are you a Christian? Are you a spy? Maybe you're sent by the Masons. How do we know? Who are you? <laughs> um, yeah. YouTube commenters believe that I'm uh, with MI6 <laughs> or the <laughs> CIA. <laughs> um, so I'm a civilian. Uh, my name is Lloyd de Jong. I'm South African. I live in Poland. I lived in the Middle East for 11 years. I, I worked in security for much of that time. I worked in national security. So I was a civilian engineer slash consultant uh, to government, to law enforcement, to military. I designed and well, I designed long range wide area security systems, very high end, very expensive, very high tech systems to protect national borders or critical infrastructure from from intrusion and obviously these assets and people from destruction. So mm. I've traveled across the entire Middle East. I was present in in a number of countries, the entire Gulf and other countries besides, including India. And I was watching and seeing Islamic dysfunction in these countries firsthand. And, but I, I must say, look, I've met many great Muslims. I've known many fantastic Muslims, wonderful people, great friends. Um, but I, firsthand, I was able to see the dysfunction and also the honesty coming from the government people I was working with who would say openly that, you know, these people are a threat and those people are a threat, whereas the Westerners were you know, inviting these, these quote unquote refugees and others freely into their countries like Germany, whereas the same Middle Eastern governments refused these people entry because they said they were dangerous and they would give their wow. reasons. So 
I also, as a, as a security consultant, I would listen, I would learn, and I wanted to know in detail. Now, two things happened. One, I dated some Muslim girls, many uh -oh. Muslim people. Bad boy. Many Muslim people live double lives, and they are quite literally afraid that their families will kill them, literally kill them if they found out. And I was shocked to learn this and discover this. And then two, and I wanted to know why, what, what was wrong, how, why this mindset was so different and to me crazy. And then two, I studied uh, counterterrorism uh, through Leiden University, an online course to supplement my, my, my work. And when Raqqa fell, a, a cache of books was recovered and the entire training that they were given by their imams was made available for a short while and I had access to these. And these were standard Sunni texts. There was nothing weird or obscure. These were standard Sunni Islamic texts. Well, and if, uh, yes, let me interject. When you say Raqqa, just to educate us who may not be aware where Raqqa is and when did it fall and what is Raqqa and they found a, tre uh, <clears throat> a treasure so chest of what one did this that was during the heyday during the heyday of ISIS when they were at the at their peak they had their capital in Raqqa mm. and so this was where they had their, their main headquarters eventually of course ISIS was defeated militarily there and I spent I spent plenty of time in Iraq and so on, and um, you know, working on projects which had to well, dealing with, with security issues related to ISIS and Al Qaeda and, uh, and other groups. And so these were their I, books, ISIS books, then. Yeah, but these were standard Sunni Islamic texts. There was nothing strange about them. These were normal, standard, commonly available. You can go buy them in an Islamic bookstore today, anywhere. And so, so there was nothing odd. And so I started reading and then I discovered the Sharia manuals and I started reading those. This was around 2015. And then, of course, there was also the Bataclan massacre, the, the attacks in Paris. And, and this spurred me on even more to want to learn why is this happening? And I obviously had the standard understanding of Islam. And, and then I thought, no, there's more to this. And um, so coming at it from a consultant slash engineer point of view, I eventually read the Sharia and I realized, hold on, this explains, this takes one verse or one hadith and gives you such incredible detail. Like one verse can become 40, 50 pages of detailed legal rulings and explanations of what it means, how it's applied, when it's applied, who it applies to in, in incredible detail. And the, when I presented this information in the counterterrorism course, I was banned. I was thrown off. Who so, threw you off? Muslims started to complain. I realized that they were trolling. They were, they were watching the, the forum deliberately to prevent anyone from discussing Islam. Because when it came to Christian terrorism, you could talk about that whole day. You could, you could say whatever you liked. And when it came to Buddhist terrorism, you could talk about that all day. But when it came to Islamic terrorism, it was like, oh, yeah, Islamic terrorism. Oh, you know, these Muslims get blamed for everything. Oh, wow, there's a squirrel. Let's go have lunch. Uh -huh. and, and that was the lesson on Islamic terrorism. And... Um, and I was like, okay, that's weird. So I said, hold on, wait, 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 hold on. Here in the Sharia, read this. Here's the legal definition of jihad. Here's the legal definition of, uh, you know, explaining lying, explaining, um, you know, killing people for apostasy. Here it's, it's in depth. There's multiple pages. This is from the founders of the schools of faith. And uh, next thing you know, I got banned. So I was like, okay, fine. You, you started this. I'll finish it. Glory to God. So that was your introduction into the real face of islam because you're reading their authentic primary sources books that <clears throat> al-qaeda were reading that were left behind when the fall of raqqa now real quickly i just want to give an acknowledgement tahir hassan for those of you guys this is a former muslim who gave his life to the lord jesus christ so tahir hassan welcome to the family of god May the Lord Jesus seal you and all of us. And I ask the Lord Jesus, bless our brother Lloyd and anoint him by the spirit to speak clearly and accurately for the glory of Jesus Christ and enable us to understand the things we hear. Have your way, Holy Spirit. You are the teacher. Teach through Lloyd, your servant, to magnify Christ, expose Islam, and bring Muslims to the feet of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's amen. what he says. Tahar Hassan, he used to be a Muslim. He now follows Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, renounced Islam, and he says this to you. Lloyd, sir, is very informed on Islamic terms. It's really good that now more and more apologetics can refute the lies, Dawa gang spread to mainstream media and people. So thank, thank you, you for coming. And by the way, folks, this is just the first of many series. 
I was trying to bring him on last year, but I got tied up. And then to God put in my heart, invite him. So this won't be the last time that Lloyd will be on my child uh, channel. If the Lord wills, he'll be coming and doing more sessions. So now that you got into Islam with this depth, what about the Talmud? Because you also know the Talmud quite well because you've done sessions with Adam Seeker. Why did you get interested in the Talmud? So someone heard me talk about Islam and invited me on their show. They used to have a large podcast uh, guy in the US. And he said, look, you know, we... We, we study Islam, but then people started saying, well, why are you criticizing Islam? You know, Islam is a religion of peace. You need to look at the Jews because the Jews can lie to you. The Jews can eat your babies. The, the Jews can, you know, and a whole litany of claims. And so I was like, okay, well, fine. If, if that's the case, let me go and read the Talmud. So my, my friend and I, we took several months. I took at least three months and we read the Talmud in depth. Now, I'm, I'm not saying we read every page, but I spent literally months reading it. And then I went and interviewed various um, rabbis. I sat down, I spoke with some, I called others, we, we set up meetings, we spoke. And I started to investigate and I started to learn. And I realized that, that by this point, I became quite well versed in the understanding of the Talmud. And then what I discovered was that People were taking, for instance, when you go into the Talmud, there's a common claim, and I've showed this on other channels, where it says that that a Jew can lie to you, right? Now, this is taken from a very specific line in a very specific passage in the Talmud. However, this is actually not a statement. It's just a question. So they're repeating half of like a sentence. The sentence said 20 words, and they're taking like 12 words and saying, here, hey, Jews can lie to you. Well, it's like taking five words from the Bible and saying, God says that, that you can eat babies for breakfast, right? So, I mean, you know what Muslims do with the Bible. I mean, if they're yeah, willing exactly. to do that with the Bible, then they will do the same with, with other sources. So, however, if you read through, you realize someone is posing a question, and then there's a debate, which goes on for paragraphs. And at the end... The rabbi steps in and says, no, you may not lie because this will desecrate the name of God because God is truth and lying will desecrate the name of God. And therefore you cannot lie. And I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. And then I, when I found this, I went to my friend and said, hey, look, did you see this? Because we've always, we've always seen the first sentence, not, not, not the 60, 70, 80, 100, 200 sentences after it that discuss this topic in detail. And, I, and he said, wait, there might be more. So we started researching and then we wrote a little paper on it. And we did several shows on it. And um, so what we discovered was whatever people are saying in the Talmud, if you read a little further, you realize that actually the conclusions are utterly completely different from the claim. Hmm. So that's what got you interested. Now, one more thing before we get into the presentation. You said something quite interesting. You said that when Muslim refugees try to flee to Muslim countries, Muslim countries don't want to have anything to do with them? That was a common occurrence. Yes. Yes. That was a very okay. common well, occurrence. I want the Westerners to hear what you just said. Guys, hear what this man said. When the Muslim refugees wanted to flee to other Muslim countries, the Muslim governments did not allow them because they knew they would create trouble. And yet the West <clears throat> lets them come in in droves, huh? Yeah. You know wow. what broke my heart in Lebanon? I went to Lebanon several times because um, there, there was a battle between ISIS and um, the guys in Lebanon, um, uh, oh, what's the name of the, the, the group in Lebanon now again? Uh, Is it uh, Hezbollah? Hezbollah, yes, Hezbollah. So I was in the Bekaa Valley. And so anyway, details, details. But there were genuine Syrian refugees. And I spent a bit of time going through this area, you know, several trips. And I saw genuine Syrian refugees and it broke my heart. I, I can't tell you the, the poverty, the desperation, people with families with nothing, just literally rags. Their clothes were rags. They were in the one camp, they had poles of wood, right? Four poles with plastic wrapped around it and plastic over it and a tarpaulin on the floor. And this was their house because everything, ISIS had, de had destroyed their houses and these people were living in poverty. And then you see photos from Germany of a guy in Levi's with Ray-Bans, you know, a brand new Samsung with Nikes, a lovely leather belt and fancy clothing. And this is a refugee from Syria. And I'd seen the refugees firsthand. And I'm like, that's not a refugee, especially when I used to see them in groups of three or four. To me, that's a trained cell, mm. right? So, 
so th those are th that's a trained cell operating as a unit. So yeah. Uh, my, may God have mercy on us, and may the Muslims come to know the true God revealed in Jesus. So now, brother, you're, you, I know this is a general title. I know you can go in a million directions, and I don't mean to <clears throat> do that to you. I know because when we talk about Islam's Gnostic and Masonic connections, that is a huge, general, broad <clears throat> mm -hmm. topic. So if you want, you if you're interested, as the Spirit leads you, because I want to bring you back, even as soon as next week depending on your schedule if the lord wills whenever you want to come my channel will be your no, channel i'd love to thank you oh you asked me if i'm a christian yes i am I, I never thought of myself as as a as an evangelist or as someone who does apologetics but i just felt that given my experience given my background someone had to say what needed to be said i had to step up brother you are an apologist whether you like it or not because you are equipping the body of christ and exposing islam not because you hate muslims but because you know islam is of the <clears throat> devil from the pit of hell and muslims need to escape so glory to god for your work so <clears throat> I, a lot of people are ex excited about masonry as well because it's very controversial okay. and you know about the theories of bilderbergers and trilateral commission and so on that's not really the focus the focus is islam's connection to gnosticism and masonry so brother you feel free how you want to begin if you want to start with the gnostic influence on islam or islam and masonry it's your your show i'm just here to facilitate because you're going to come back and do more sessions god willing to go deeper on all these categories so feel free to share feel free to talk on whatever issue okay so yeah this would take a number of shows to discuss and to go into depth sure. but let, let's do the first one and if questions come up we can always try and divert so we can do a general overview um generally sticking to the topic so what, let me share my screen and we'll start with that See, like this sister just said, didn't know Islam had Masonic connections too. See, they're like, really? No way. So the fact is that the, so there's a lot to be explained. There's a lot that needs to be Please. presented to, to build the foundation. But the Muslim scholars, the highest scholars claim that they founded Freemasonry, that they are the original Freemasons. And Say they that claim... Again. I want to stop you at key points, so don't be frustrated with me, brother, because you they say founded statements. Freemasonry, and they are the original Freemasons. That's, That's what Muslims say. teach? This is what many of the, the top scholars say, yes. Wow, you got it. Okay, I just want people to hear this. So I'm going to stop him to emphasize points to shock the heck out of you guys. Muslim scholars believe they are the true Masons, and they are yeah. the ones basically who brought Masonry into the world. See the shocking statements, brother? You see how shocked they are? <laughs> Yeah. Now, now, many people will say, well, you know, Lloyd is wrong because, you know, these were the Egyptians in the 19th and 20th century that, that, you know, actually they got Freemasonry from Europe, you know, and they thought it was cool. And they were just kind of like, you know, it was just kind of cosplay for them. And no, it actually goes back much, much earlier than that. It goes back well before that. So, you know, even, even the Muslims laugh at that, you know, so, um, yeah, but let, let's let's talk about the topic. Let's start to introduce all of this, and yes. uh, we start to learn more. I mean, Muslim scholars do claim, at least the claim, whether how true it is, exactly how it is true, and so on and so on. But they do claim that they infiltrated masonry into England and Scotland. So the claim is made. Okay, so um, let's let's start with an important Islamic fact. I like to do this. I heard the Messenger of Allah saying, "Do not kill your children secretly for the milk with which a child is suckled." while his mother is pregnant, overtakes the horseman and throws him from his horse. Now, this is the hikama, um, you know, so uh, praise be to Allah for this kind of wisdom. I got, wait, I, 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 you just, you wait. Do not kill your children secretly for the milk with which a child is suckled while his mother's pregnant, overtakes the horseman and throws him from his horse. Uh, you've left me so confused. It's going to take me three lifetimes to understand what the heck this hikmah is. So please help me, brother. So. Well, I mean, it does teach us, do not kill your children secretly, Sam. So. <laughs> so <laughs> All right. it's, hey. I'm... I don't know. Man, you threw me off with that quote. I didn't even know this. <laughs> I, I like to just throw these in sometimes just so they can realize just the kind of mentality we are dealing with here. Wow. So I can kill them. Not secretly. If I do it openly, that's okay. Yeah, beautiful. This is see, but that's why you're in Kafir because you don't believe the wisdom the Hikmah of Allah and His Messenger. 
You need to apply. Yeah, sadly, um, you know, I'm clearly not smart enough to understand this, but moving on. So we're going to talk about Gnosticism and Islam, right? Now, I have a different series on my channel where I discuss Gnosticism in depth. I've also done very deep discussions with Reason Dances, Thaddeus, on his channel. I've gone into serious depth on that topic with the with the Gnostic connections to Islam from the very earliest times of Gnosticism and how these these Gnostic antecedents make it straight into Islam. How it's and how in fact the Muslim scholars, and we will show you this within the Sharia itself, within the legal system, the, the law of Islam, they claim that Islam is a Gnostic religion. This is this is an explicit claim. It is not an illusion, you know, they're alluding to it, they are stating this explicitly what the scholars state. So Gnosticism is the greatest threat to ever face the church. Exactly. At the yeah. founding of the church and now. Now we will discuss in this Gnostics, we'll give a brief overview. We will discuss how Islam is explicitly a Gnostic religion. There's plenty of information to be found if you look. Uh, we speak of the Nicene Creed briefly. We are affirming Christian doctrine and refuting heresies. And we look at some Gnostic heresies and then biblical warnings against false gnosis. And then, of course, how Islam demotes Jesus and the deity of Muhammad, because you'll find that this, these same stories, these Gnostic stories made their way into the Quran and other Islamic sources, the Apocrypha, these Jewish myths, these Gnostic legends from various Gnostic groups, all made it into Islam because, you know, the Christology of Islam is entirely Gnostic and apocryphal. It is not orthodox, right? And of course, we will talk about Muhammad as the deity because in, within the Sira, Muhammad becomes the counterfeit Jesus. Muhammad is a deity. Muhammad was made literally from the same essence as Allah. Allah took a piece of himself and created Muhammad before the world was created. You're kidding then, me. Does wait, before, wait, we're taught that uh, Islam teaches absolute pure monotheism and Muhammad is just a servant. You're going to prove from Muslim sources that's a lie? They're covering that up? I have done this on Adam Seeker's channel. I mean, I've done hours of video on Adam Seeker's channel and mine and others where we go through the Sira. And this is, this is a standard claim that Muhammad, even the greatest scholars of Islam discuss this. Muhammad was made from the light of Allah. Muhammad is a piece of Allah, literally a piece of Allah. And then Allah took a piece of Muhammad, right? tiny fractions and he put it into Adam and this is the light of Adam and the holiness of Adam and the soul and spirit and the goodness of Adam is, is a piece of Muhammad. So Muhammad's light shines out of Adam and then he put one in Noah and Abraham and Jesus and David and Moses and all of their holiness is the holiness of Muhammad shining through them. And then the world was made for Muhammad. Allah creates the heavens and the earth for Muhammad. And then of course, so the, so, so the earth is made from the essence of Muhammad. The sky is made from the essence of Muhammad. And then of course, the light of, our, of paradise is Muhammad's light. The light of the world is Muhammad's light. Muhammad is the light of Allah's throne. So yes, these claims are made within the Sita. I'm glad you're here, brother, because you're going to expose the true Islam that Muhammad has become the counterpart to Jesus. He is a deity supplanting Jesus Christ. So thank you, brother. And the final yeah. part, you, what is the final part right there? Islamic orthodoxy. Go ahead. So yeah, Islamic occult connections to Templars, the KKK, and the Freemasons. <laughs> um, it should be noted that, um, yeah, well, no. So yeah, who knows which piece? Uh, but yes. Uh, yeah, there's a lot to be said about Allah. In fact, we will find that a, a Gnostic, um, a Gnostic by name of um, Plot, Plotinus or Plotinus, uh, he actually created a version of Allah, a version of God, which is essentially identical to the Muslim conception of Allah. So, but there's a history to that. That's something we can discuss again. But basically, you'll find that there's a Gnostic version of, of the, the one called the one, a deity, which is basically Allah to a T. So, yeah. so the concept of Allah is taken straight out of this Gnostic idea from this scholar called Plotinus. Mm. Okay, so Gnosticism was the greatest challenge and threat to the early Christian church, and Gnostic ideas thrive today. So in its early church history, the church was opposed by several mystery religions. So these mysteries involved secret societies. Islam is involved in secret societies. We will look at that. Occult, magical rituals and practices. Islam has occult, magical rituals and practices. Now, this is not to say that I know everything about this, but we will present evidence showing that it exists, and this is... This is not just evidence which can be swept under the rug or dismissed with the wave of the hand. This is evidence that needs to be investigated. So once we start to dig, because if you go into you know, the premier academic source on Islam, 
is called the Encyclopedia of Islam. It costs about $40,000 to buy a copy, or it's $5,000 a year to rent it. Are you kidding and me? It's $40,000? Yeah, to buy a set. Yeah. Wow. yeah, it's expensive. Woo. And so, so what happens is when you read through this, you'll find that so many Islamic legal terms and so many Islamic theological terms, the Encyclopedia of Islam has a second meaning of it. And it's usually related like 40% of the time, it has an occult or magical meaning, mm. something to do with ritual magic. And you're like, why are so many terms related to magic and ritual that is not being discussed? Right. Yeah. So now we will speak of the levels of understanding and of the secret knowledge in Islam. Then we'll speak of the denial of Jesus' divinity, death, resurrection, and so on. And of course, their radical reinterpretation of biblical doctrine, which is a standard Gnostic practice as well. So second century Gnosticism in brief. So the physical world of matter is cursed. It is evil. And it was created or ruled by a lesser God, the Demiurge, who is lower than humans, right? Now, spirit is good. Matter is bad. In fact, hold on. While we're here, maybe I can just bring up something. Now, on that point, many people know, um, actually, there's a word that I need to find here. Um, yes, take your time, brother. Yep. Actually, know what? I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. It's, it's, it's during the, it will come up later. Um, but so spirit is good, but matter is evil. Right, liberation is attained through esoteric knowledge, and of course, it denies the incarnation. God is spirit and pure; thus, his humanity must be an illusion. Now, of course, these stories are present within the Islamic narrative as well, and of course, the Allah of Islam cannot come to Earth, and this is a Gnostic thing. God doesn't come to Earth because matter is dirty. Now, right, we will continue. So, heretical Gnosticism. The name Gnosticism was applied to a variety of schools that differed in their reinterpretations of the Christian faith. The common principle of unity is all standing in opposition to Christianity. They are not. Now, I'll deviate here. Bart Ehrman constantly speaks of there were many Christianities yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. Now, what few people realize is that Bart is, well, he's, he's talking complete trash, but Bart is using what's called the Bauer Thesis. So he is aping what is called the Bauer thesis. Few people realize the foundation of his ideas is based on a scholar that died in the 30s, lived in the 1800s, uh, died in the 1930s. And Mr. Bauer, Werner Bauer, he was very important for writing a Greek lexicon that's very well known and still used today. But or, or he was claiming there were, these contra there were these competing versions of Christianity, but they were not competing. They were utterly contradictory. They were a denial of Christianity. And he claimed they were all equal versions and the Catholic Church was the biggest guy in the bunch, beat everyone up, and therefore we have the, the, the Catholic Jesus today, right? We have that version of Jesus. Let me ask you, I'm sorry, I'm, because yeah. I'm going to ask questions for clarification for me because sure, I'm sure. learning I'm your student. The Catholic Church is the boogeyman again? So, um, just like the yeah, Jews, yeah. So Catholics and the Jews have always been the boogeyman? They're, the res they're responsible for everything that happens in the world, huh? All right, just go ahead. And the aliens as well, don't forget, and Bigfoot. Bigfoot too. Uh, you got it, bro. <laughs> yeah. So, so the idea is, but the fact is that these ideas are utterly contradictory to, to Christian orthodoxy, right? So they could not have been equal Christianities. These were contradictory ideas. And the Bauer thesis also only uses sources from the second century onwards. Mr. Bauer ignores first century sources. How can this be authentic? So, so this Bauer guy creates this completely, I mean, the idea has been shown to be completely erroneous so many times but it's still persistent because academics want christianity to be false now everybody wants to contradict the bible and prove that oh the bible is false no one goes to well julius caesar is false or you know or the works of shakespeare are like to are to be debunked or you know hannibal's invasions or books about hannibal are to be debunked that's so that's just an academic opposition to christianity wow. so they all believed christianity is false and it cannot afford absolute truth, and they have a hostile attitude to Christianity. So they claimed the possession of superior knowledge higher than that of ordinary believers. And we will see that Islamic scholars make the very same claim. Right, so when we go to McClintock and Strong's, this is James Strong from Strong's Concordance, right? They tell us in their biblical cyclopedia, the Gnostics seldom pretended to demonstrate the principles on which their systems were founded by historical evidence or logical reasonings. Now, 
in fact, the same we, we can show that the very same is within, within Islam because lay Muslims are not to ask for evidence. They are required to believe without evidence. They simply have to accept, to hear and obey. They rather boasted that, they, that these were discovered by the intuitional powers of a more highly endowed mind. They constructed systems of speculation on subjects entirely beyond the range of human knowledge. Now, we all know that the, the Gnostics, and they are present today as well, there's more Gnosticism today in the world than ever before. They have zero historical evidence to back up their claims. They have no historical validity. No. Any comments before I move on? So just so people understand, the Gnostics could not appeal to history or even rationality. They were appealing to knowledge that came from a higher source that they were privy to, and you needed to blindly follow them in order to know this secret wisdom. So if they yes. were to try to anchor it in history, they couldn't do it. Correct. Correct. Okay. Nothing in the in their story can be proven in history. Nothing. Good. But there we are. Which is, as we know, Islam is also historically dubious. Yep. So nice. now, of course, in Mark 4, 22, we have, for there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. Okay. So Christianity okay. is built on not having secret knowledge. And of course, hopefully this tells us that the secrets will come to light. And hopefully we are in that process of revealing these secrets. Okay. I've spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. So Jesus himself in the Bible refutes the claims that the, he gave secret knowledge to certain people. Amen. You know, it's interesting, Lloyd, to, just so people to show you that you're in continuity with the early apologists. That's one of the arguments of Irenaeus. Oh, here you go. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, you already, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So you already anticipated where I was going. So you got it. See? Great minds. Yeah. You love church fathers. Go ahead. Yeah. So if you go to Ignatius, uh, Ignatius was a was a was a Baptist, by the way, and Justin Martyr was a Pentecostal from <laughs> Cincinnati, if I recall. But oh. Ignatius, I want to forewarn you not to get snagged on the hooks of worthless opinions, but instead to be fully convinced about the birth and suffering of the resurrection of Christ. They were fighting their own battles, ideological battles against the Gnostics. These persons, Justin Martyr says, seem to be ignorant of the whole work of God, both of the Genesis and formation of man at the first and why the things in the world were made. Now, if his death be denied because of the denial of his flesh, there will be no certainty of his resurrection. So many of the heresies and, you know, Arianism and such, and the Gnostics, this would undermine utterly the Christian premise that Christ died, Christ rose, and that he overcame death. Yeah. So, yes, their denial of the fundamental aspect of Christianity, which Islam also denies. Similarly, if Christ's resurrection be denied, ours is destroyed. That's right. Irenaeus, these men overthrow the faith of many by drawing them away under a pretense of knowledge from him who founded and adorned the universe. So yeah, they, they had lots to say. They wrote hundreds and thousands of pages against Gnostics. Right, so jump in anytime, please. So let's have a look. Gnosticism. Gnosticism comes in many varieties and interpretations from ascetic to licentious. Licentious means lacking legal or moral restraints. And I think we know of a certain prophet that had those exact problems, especially well, you know, disregarding sexual restraints. But I thought Muhammad is a moral exemplar. He's a standard of morality and ethics. What are you talking? That's why you're a kafir, but I'll let you slide on that one. Go ahead. I look, I'm from Africa, as you know, schools are bad out there. I attended a school for emotionally disturbed teachers. Maybe you went to the same school. Me too. Yeah. I'm disturbed, yes. <laughs> it had a debilitating effect on my mental development. So notice though, also, it is marked by disregard for strict rules of correctness. Muhammad violated all of the rules of the Ten Commandments. He had he disregarded, he had sexual slaves. I mean, he had a child. We we all know the story. So we don't have to go there. I mean, jihad and so on. You know, Islam has some serious problems. People know that from my discussions on Sharia. So it's a religious philosophy and cosmogony. It's a framework to explain the nature of God and creation, good and the problem of evil, man and the purpose of life. But it is, of course, entirely a fictional concept. Gnostics focus on the inner life of the spirit, which they think differ, which, which they differentiate from material. Now, we can apply this thinking to, and we'll discuss this briefly. I identify as, you know, we see it today that yeah. the external doesn't matter, but the world of the imagination, this irrational world of the imagination, that's what counts. These are Gnostic thoughts. 
I identify as you pick your, uh, although archaeologists, when they look at skeletons, can only find two genders, but hey, you know. But they're, they're corrupt because they're not privy to the secret knowledge. So just so people understand, this gender identity confusion that directly ties in to the Gnostic influence, huh? Yes. There you go. So you guys are hearing it? Gnosticism hasn't died. Gnosticism has mutated in different forms and ideologies. It's still here, live and kicking. But go ahead, brother. Yeah. So let's look at Gnostics. Male and female distinction is a corruption. Now, I will, now on all of these topics, I've got different talks that discuss these at greater or lesser length, but I'm touching on various topics here. So do check my channel or make a note and I can come back to these in more depth in the future. Give me, if you can, send me the link to your channel on uh, private chat. I forgot to link it in the description. I'll put it back. Sorry about okay, that. Okay, great. Yeah, I know that um, Andrew has been popping it into the chat as well. So thank you, Andrew. Um, so the distinction between men and women must be rejected according to many Gnostic beliefs because it is a part of the useless creation order. It's the world of matter, which is evil. The ideal is androgyny, a synthesis of male and female, neither one nor the other. The outworking of this ranges from godless worship, while well, goddess worship to saying women need to become men to be saved. Now, have a look here. This is from the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. You just took right, right the this... idea out of my mind, saying 114. But yep. Go ahead. Yeah, one, in fact, there's another one prior to that that has a very similar theme as well. So Jesus actually supposedly says, when you make the male and the female one and the same so that the male is not male nor the female female, then you will enter the kingdom. And in fact, Jesus goes on to say that women must become men to be saved. They wow. must become men before they can enter the kingdom. Now, brothers, did you hear this? The Gospel of Thomas is a Gnostic forgery falsely attributed to the disciple Thomas that was found in the Nag Hammadi Library, 1945. Understand, he just quoted two sayings from this Gnostic corruption of Jesus' gospel, where Jesus says to Peter, he's going to make Mary Magdalene a male to be worthy to enter the kingdom. And here they attributed Jesus, there's neither male nor female. Do you see this? That's where transgenderism is coming from, from this demonic ideology. Thank you, brother, yeah. for that information. And in fact, it says, um, he goes on to say that um, women are not worthy of life. Hmm. Jesus supposedly says women are not worthy of life. Now, remember, when we start to investigate Islam, we start to see that their entire Christology and so many of their stories are literally ripped out of the pages of these Gnostic texts. So, and of course, why is Islam so antithetical towards women? Well, maybe they took that from the Gnostics. Now, of course, Genesis 1, 27 says, in the image of God, he created him male and female. So that's the Christian belief. We have a completely different design, right? Simon Peter said to him, let Mary leave us for women are not worthy of life. And Jesus said, I shall make myself, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. So that's the Bam. full quote. There it goes. Bam. Saying 114. There it is. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So bear that in mind. So now the Gospel of Thomas contains 114 supposed sayings of Jesus, and the modern Quran is 114 chapters. Is that a coincidence? Yeah. 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 Just, yeah. just an oddity. Right. Deuteronomy or Deuteroscopy 22 5. Um, <laughs> Mosaic law. Right. A woman must not wear men's clothing, nor a man wear women's clothing, for the Lord your God detests anyone who does this. Now, this, of course, goes against Christian doctrine. So they're not being free. They are violating Christian law. They're violating Christian precepts. They're going against the God of the Bible. This is quite bluntly what is happening. Right. So Gnosticism in popular culture. So we see Gnosticism rejected by the early church. It never went away, though. The Da Vinci Code suggests that Gnostic Gospels contain truth about Christ and he married Mary Magdalene. Now, I have a different video. It's only about five minutes long on my channel that recent that discusses this. What are the Gnostic Gospels? It's called Dan Brown is utterly fabricating this idea because the in the book that he's referring to the Gospel of Philip, it, it is never claimed that Jesus married Mary Magdalene. There is nothing beyond the friendship there that they knew each other cordially and discussed things. And two, the book is in tatters. There's very little of it left. So he is ent entirely making baseless suppositions here. The claims are utterly specious. Now, notice John Lennon, the only true Christians were the Gnostics who believe in self-knowledge, i.e. becoming Christ themselves, reaching the Christ within John Lennon. 
Wow. Garbage. He was influenced by this garbage too, huh? So all of the self-discovery, you know, that's a very, very Gnostic idea, you know. And yeah. So there's this book. I'm not going to go into depth here, but there's actually this this book is very interesting. Philip J. Lee against the Protestant Gnostics. Mm. Gnosticism has also made its way into the Protestant church. Right. So there's an and he discusses this at length. And he speaks of gnosis and magic masquerading under the cloak of religion. And we will find both within Islam. So mm. that's just to make that right. And, so, and he's saying it's also permeated Protestant denominations, huh? It's One can see elements of it. I mean, I'm not here to, to create. Look, I, I'm a Protestant. I come from the Protestant church. But that said, um, when I look at where my church is going and the, and the proclamations it's made, I look at that and I go, I did not sign up for that. Yeah, the, exactly. they've clearly gone off the rails i mean i yeah. look at that and i'm like damn they've gone off the rails this is not where the church is meant to go and uh, so i reject that so uh gnosticism and gnosis in islamic law so let's examine the references to gnosticism gnosis gnostic islamic scholars in the world's most famous and the world's most popular islamic law manual so let's start here this is the reliance of the traveler. So let me go back here. This is the reliance of the traveler. This is the most famous, most popular, most common, most available, most sold Islamic law manual in the world. Now, Muslims always say, well, Lloyd, it's not. You're wrong. And I'm like, and then I say, okay, so please tell me which one is. And they yeah. somehow never do. Yeah. Yeah, you exactly. know? So if yeah. I'm wrong about that, please advise me and let me know which one so we can read that one and check. You wouldn't want to hide anything from us, would you? Yeah. So... So let's have a look. Um, let's go back up here. So, okay. So notice here, in the world's most famous Sunni Islamic law manual, we've got here, they speak of the spiritual station of annihilation in Gnostic vision. Mm. And why are they talking about Gnosis amongst these scholars? We'll talk more about that. <clears throat> Stopping at the first traces of Gnosis, because when you become a senior scholar, you learn to use the Quran as a focus device. You learn to utter incantations. These nonsense letters of the Quran are designed to disassociate you from rationality. They're, they're, they're gibberish, which in one sense helps you to separate your mind and enter into what they call a post-rational state. And then you go through these levels and you enter into the throne room with Allah and you commune with Allah that way directly. Oh, wow. So this is what the advanced students of Islam are seeking to achieve. So just people can understand. Yeah. These discombobulated letters in the Quran, they believe are deliberate there. So as you focus on them, you then disconnect from rationality, logic. So you can go into this state where it's purely just mystical and you enter into the realm of the spirit that transcends logic so you can connect with Allah. That's what they're yes. focusing on. Yeah, that's yeah, nice. and they say, don't stop at the first traces of Gnosis because you see those, those previous Gnostics, the wannabe Gnostics, not the true Muslim Gnostics, they would think when they got the lowest levels that they were awesome. But no, 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 no. You know, you got to go beyond that, mm. right? you got to go to the higher levels. And others have claimed to attain to Gnosis and contemplative knowledge of the divine to have reached nearness to Allah. But, you know, those guys were just wannabes. It's us Muslims, we scholars, we have attained to Gnosis. Wow. wow. See, so we have attained, mm. right? The Gnostics in his, in the first of his states. Now, the, when they say Gnostics, so if someone's going to go, well, you know, when they say Gnostic, what they really mean is, and like, no, they mean Gnostics. Yeah. Right? This is not the only source available on earth that discusses Gnosticism and Islam. The scholars will happily tell you there's plenty of information, videos, books, you name it. Right. The Gnostics' spiritual will exalted above all else. Right. Let's continue. They have reached the level of those to whom the unseen, right, the ghayb, is disclosed and who have Gnostic insight. The Muslims have achieved Gnostic wisdom. You wow. see? Sure. The doors of the Gnosis, contemplative knowledge of the divine, opens to them. When they sniff the first traces of knowledge, you see the hikama, see, the knowledge, right? Yeah. Now, they speak here of, oh, this is interesting though, they speak here of in this, let me show you this briefly, the perfection of faith. The perfection of faith is to adore Allah, right? Now, it says you must adore Allah, and they say here, now, notice here on the very bottom, it says, 
all three of these are of the perfection of faith, but the perfection required for the validity of worship is only the first. Only the first. So let's see, what is the first here? To worship in a way that fulfills its obligations by observing all its conditions and integrals. In other words, just like the Pharisees had these rules that you followed, you know, you did follow, you did these things, these these works, basically a religion of works, you will be saved, right? And this is for the lay Muslim, but the scholars have to do additional things. For the scholar, he must be immersed in the sea of Gnostic inspiration, the Mukashafa. And he must worship, as mentioned above, aware that Allah sees one, the station of vigilance, the next station after annihilation, and there's 12 stations or something. All three of these are of the perfection of faith, but the perfection required for the validity of worship is only the first, whilst perfection in the latter senses is the mark of the elect and not possible for many. So mm. only the elite, the elect, can achieve this level of Islamic perfection. The elect, the special group, those yes. Gnostics who have the keys of the unseen that you need to follow them blindly. Yeah, they are comprehended through the Gnosis, you see. The Gnostics, they speak here of the Gnostics, the chess of the Gnostics, Gnosis, Gnosis, and so on. But you, I hope I've made my point that the, the main yeah. Islamic manual speaks at length about the Gnosis of the scholars, that yes. they are the true Gnostics. And you know what's interesting? Even Hamza Yusuf, I used to listen to him religiously. He talks about gnosis, Gnosticism. And I noticed that this sounds like the Gnostics of the time that the church fathers were condemning, but you now brought it together. Islam is not Gnosticism, repackaged. Yeah. Um, yes, it is a repackaged form of Gnosticism. There's something else I need to show you, but I, it will come up later when I'm trying to remember what the phrases I need to look for. But let's see, okay, so Gnosticism is liberation through knowledge. And you, of course, are separated from the other humans because you're smarter than them, right? Okay. You're liberated from, you're not saved from, right? So humanity is alienated, right? Gnosticism in Islam versus a good creation. They believe that creation is bad, right? And no. creation is good. On the sixth day, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Gnosticism does not have a positive vision of creation, nor does Islam. They deny a direct link between creation and God. Islam denies that Jesus had direct knowledge of God. So Jibril, yeah. the Ruach, the Ruach al Khuds, intercedes. However, when you read through the Islamic sources, Mo is often the Ruach al Khuds. He is the, the Holy Spirit. In Islamic so, sources, they depict Muhammad as the Ruach? Yes, in many cases they do, yes. Now, Muhammad just for the Holy I'm going to ask this because obviously a Muslim has to answer it. So just so we got what you said, because you can't have direct contact with God. So Jesus didn't have direct contact with God. There was an intermediary, Jibril or the Ruh, and at times he's equated Muhammad. But isn't yes. that a contradiction? Because isn't that a creature who has to then have contact with God to then communicate to another creature? How would that work? I mean, I'm not quite following you, not with you. So okay. oh, the Holy Spirit that. would then... Jibril, Ruh is a creature. Yes, and yes. So he mediates the knowledge of God, but that means a creature has direct contact with God, and what he receives from God, he's passing on to another creature. So they yeah. end up shooting themselves in the foot, huh? They contradict themselves constantly okay. on a lot of issues. Because when you go into the Sira, Muhammad is a piece of Allah. And okay. it just, but then in other times, the Ruh is its own essence, its own entity, and other times it's Muhammad. So it's, nothing makes sense. Yeah, now that's right. what I was wanting so, to. People see the contradiction. Notice this Gnosticism is full of errors. That's why they go beyond rationality. I just wanted to see that. Because if they're saying you can't have direct contact with God, so you need an intermediary, but that intermediary is a creature who has direct contact with God, thereby imploding on themselves. I just wanted to highlight that stupidity. But go ahead, brother. I don't want to cut off. Like uh, there's, a, there's a term that I need to find. Once I find it, it will make more sense. But So then final point here. Islam saves us from the Jahiliyyah. Now, people try to say that the Jahiliyyah was, oh, the 7th century, the 8th century. No, we are still in the Jahiliyyah. Islam saves you with, with its sacred knowledge from the Jahiliyyah, which is the condition of ignorance. If you're not a Muslim, you are in the Jahiliyyah. See, Jahiliyyah is the opposite of Islam. And Islam has to save you from the Jahiliyyah. So if you're not a Muslim, well, you are ignorant. In other words, in plain English language, sucks being you, mister. But go ahead, brother. Yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> I'll skip over a little bit of this stuff. <clears throat> Let's maybe have a look at some of this. So the ulama, okay, scholars, 
more specifically, the scholars of the religious sciences. So science is a, religion is a science in Islam, right? They're the guardians, the transmitters and interpreters of religious knowledge, of Islamic doctrine and law, right? And they fulfill religious functions in the community that require, notice, a certain level of expertise. They have secret knowledge, right? And the ulama, notice here, have long been seen, this is from the Encyclopedia of Islam, which is not known as a conspiracy theory book, right? The ulama have long been seen as a very distinct group, regulated and structured body in Islam, expressing the popular voice, the, the will of the people, constituting the solid framework of permanent government behind changing dynasties. Does that sound like maybe an Illuminati? Yeah, exactly. You guys, you caught this? These ulama are the ones who are working beyond the scenes to influence governments. Exactly. Wow. Guys, catch this. Listen attentively by the grace of God. This is me. Wow. Well, actually, let me bring up something. So while I'm here, because I, I will probably bring it up later, but let me bring up something. I'm going to bring up this. So wow. while we're here. Okay. Okay. This is... Al Ghazali. This is the niche for lights, the Mishkat al Anwar, right? Now, Ghazali is considered the highest of the Islamic scholars, even one step above the Imams who founded the four schools of fiqh. So let's have a look here. This is now. I want to show you this. So he is the greatest scholar of Islam after Muhammad himself. He's considered the Hujjat al Islam, the proof of Islam. That's one of his names. He's the only one that has this as like his major title, right? The Hujjat, the proof of Islam. He proved Islam true. And notice he says here, those who stopped short of complete illumination, right? Okay. And he goes on, contains, so basically the knowledge of the Amr, of, you know, of the, of the word of command, Amr, well, there's a term for that in Islam, but those who understand Islam, there's much, it contains much that is obscure and too difficult for most minds, except for those guys with the knowledge, right? And he, then he says that the perfect Illuminati perceived that al mutta yeah. the obeyed one, Hold on. Al-Ghazali is saying that the scholars of Islam are the perfect Illuminati. Wow. I just That's why I went in closer to the screen to see it. You have it in red. The perfect Illuminati. <laughs> and just to confirm, Lloyd, what you're saying, guys, so you know he does, he's not lying, and he's not. He's a man of integrity who loves the Lord, who's a God of truth. Hamza Yusuf, type in Hamza Yusuf Al-Ghazali, said what he said. The greatest Muslim mind was Al-Ghazali. And Hamza Yusuf loves Al Ghazali. Yeah. So he makes that claim that they are the perfect, the scholars of Islam are the perfect Illuminati. And here they say that the, this, this ulama have been a body that have been in existence for centuries. Now, I'll give you an example. Take, for instance, uh, take for instance MI5, MI6, right? Give, give you an example from people say, well, how old is MI5? Well, you know, the MI5 has started in 1953, right after World War II, when the British, no, 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 no. If you go back to Queen Elizabeth, she had <clears throat> her spy master. The need for information was vital for the survival of any, of any country. So she had her spy master back in the 1400s, whatever it was, right? That function has always existed. Someone has always provided that function. They've built up networks over centuries. That function has been there for hundreds of years. MI5 is going on seven, 800 years old. You look at the KGB, the KGB, well, you know, they were created in 1931 and they lasted until 1994. No, the KGB has been around for hundreds of years under different names, fulfilling the same function. So mm. these guys have been around for a long time behind changing dynasties. These are the power behind the throne that we don't know about. The ulama or the ruling orthodoxy within Islam, the, right, this, this deep state, if you will, according to this within the Encyclopedia of Islam. <clears throat> people know he's not quoting anti-islamic literature islamophobic literature encyclopedia of islam is a standard scholarly reference work that is not anti-muhammad just want you to know when he's quoting encyclopedia of islam the standard encyclopedia on islam that is not attacking islam is just stating the facts so remember that it's not biased against islam keep that in mind and it no, costs, it's, it's actually very pro-Islam in many cases. Yeah, say pro-Islam, and it costs thousands of dollars to get. And as and my sister, 
And it's written by Muslim scholars. I mean, there's hundreds of scholars that have contributed and at least half, if not more, are Muslims themselves. There you go. Okay, so, so I'm going to... Go ahead. So I'll jump ahead a little bit, so I'll go on. Okay, so as long... So here we go. I'll just mention this. Augustine, member of a second century Gnostic sect known as the Manichaeans. That's a long story. Augustine yes. explains that for them, Jesus not only was revealed light, and in the Sira, Muhammad is revealed light, but he was present everywhere as the Sira presents about Muhammad. And he signified man's life and man's salvation was hanging on every tree. So, okay, fine and well. Let's have a look at the Kitab Ahwal al Qiyamah. Read the following account. Now, this is about the Sira of Muhammad, the Gospels of Muhammad, often called the biographies. It is recorded by tradition that Allah first created a tree with 4,000 branches and called it the tree of life, an idea taken from the Jews, of course. Then Allah created the light of Muhammad, the first thing ever created, in a veil of white pearl, and he placed it upon that tree where this light praised Allah for 70,000 years. Right? Now, of course, it does say within the Sharia that if someone tells a deliberate lie about Muhammad, that is a sin and the penalty is death. Right? That's a crime. But, of course, people write all sorts of things about Muhammad. So, now, right, let me just... So, there's a lot more to this that I can show you. But, for instance... After 70,000 years where Muhammad praises Allah, Allah takes this, this light of Muhammad, puts it in a statue of Muhammad, and all of the, all of the entities, including you, if, if you're watching me today, including you, just so you know, because your soul was alive then, right? Your soul pre-existed you. All the angels, all the entities of heaven, all of them circled and danced around Muhammad and praised Muhammad. They, they praised Muhammad for 100,000 years. So for 70,000 years, Muhammad praised Allah, but then for 100,000 years, you, yes, you, praised Muhammad on his pedestal. And then Allah placed Muhammad on earth. My goodness. And they say, no, we only worship Allah alone. My goodness. Wow. Yes. No, I mean, the, the stories, I mean, you look at these stories, I can show that another time. So Gnosticism is a cult of special knowledge from the Greek Gnosis, right? Now, belief in a remote, unknowable, supreme, absolute one deity, the monad, known as also the Tawheed. What is interesting is that the word Tawheed exists prior to the Arabic in the Ethiopic, and it comes from the, from the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawheddo Church, right? Ethiopian Orthodox Tawheddo Church, which means the unity, the unification, right? A complex unity of more than one. So the term Tawheed is derived, and they spent, of course, 15 years in Ethiopia in the first Hijrah, and then they joined the Muslims again in Medina, right? Now, so let's continue. The divine monad is beyond the material and rational world. Now, Allah does not enter the dirty physical realm. So the Christian incarnation is unacceptable. That's the Gnostic view. So think of the polemic emphasis on Jesus as a baby being unclean, Ibn Qayyim. So let's actually have a look. Now, now I'm going to go to Ibn Qayyim, guidance to the uncertain in reply to the Jews and the Nazarenes. Let's have a look at this. He speaks here. This is a very common, very popular polemic against Christianity taught in Islam today. It's 800 years old. A religion whose structure is founded on the worship of crosses and pictures on the ceilings and walls, proclaiming that the Lord descended from the chair of his glory and became attached to the inside of a woman's womb. He dwelled in there for a period of time amidst the location where the sexual organs joined. Then he came out suckling, growing up, crying, eating, drinking, urinating, sleeping and playing with other children. This is talking about Jesus. Yeah. Then he says, we have to believe <clears throat> that the most exalted entered the vagina of a woman who eats, drinks, urinates, evacuates her bowels and menstruates. Evacuates her bowels means she poops. All right. And this is bad. Then he got attached to the inside of her abdomen. He dwelled there for nine months, wobbling between excrement, urine, and menstrual blood. Don't forget excrement, urine, and menstrual blood. Blood is bad. It's unclean. Urine is unclean. And feces is unclean in Islam. So Jesus spent time in an unclean world of matter. He was born to be swaddled, put in the cradle, and his mother breastfed him. Then he ended up being slapped on the cheeks by the Jews. This is what they teach about the Christian Jesus. My goodness, what a filthy mind, sick mind to describe it with this kind of disrespect. But they're filth anyway, like Muhammad. But yes, go ahead, brother. Yeah, and this is this is a very common, very popular polemic. So he entered the womb of a woman in the place of the monthly period and menstrual discharges for several months. And he came out suckling her breast, eating, drinking, urinating, recovering from illness and sickness. Then he made a plot against his archenemy, Satan, 
by giving himself away to his enemies, the Jews who arrested him and drove him to two slabs of wood to crucify himself on them. That's the Islamic narrative, and that's what they've been teaching for a long time. Now, the monad emanates lower divine beings called eons. Now, Islam, within its, within its philosophy, its cosmology, also teaches continuous creation. It has the same idea. Now, in the, in the Bible, God makes heaven and Adam and Eve, and they procreate. But in Islam, every child is a new creation. Thus, they have no original sin. Right. Now, the Nicene Creed, I'll jump over this, but I'll do a little bit, states that Jesus was born or made incarnate as a refutation of Gnostic heresies. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man, the divine taking physical form. <clears throat> Right, The monads, emanations, have an element of the divine essence because angels and other powers are on this spectrum. Angels are worshipped. Right, Jesus is on the spectrum, but not a supreme being. That's the Gnostic view, and it's the Islamic view. Yeah. Right. Now, of course, within like Colossians 2.8, we see that you know, no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, right? Because Christ lives in bodily form. The deity lives in bodily form. This is the biblical message, which we know. Exactly. Now, Gnosticism teaches matter is evil, okay? And the lowest of the eons, now you had the, the, the so you had the, the monad creates these eons, and these eons are a lesser order. They are gods in their own right. But then, of course, ultimately, Jesus enters the realm of the earth, right? He's the lowest of these eons, the one who had contact with men, and he's supposed to be Jesus Christ. But, I mean, there's lots of stories about this, right? Exactly. Now, this is Reliance of the Traveler, Section A, 1 Pano, page 2-9, right? They say here, notice, from Islamic law, the world and what is in it are accursed. Gnosticism teaches that the world is exactly. cursed. And they say that the only thing that is good is the remembrance of Allah, the dhikr, which is a practice of also the Sufis and the high scholars, and that which Allah loves is someone with the sacred knowledge or someone learning it, someone with the gnosis. Mm. So let's ha hammer that. Guys, you see, this is the reliance of the traveler. So did you see what he just showed you, the connection with Gnosticism? Matter is evil. What did this <clears throat> manual of Islamic jurisprudence say? The world, everything in it is, is cursed, except when you do dhikr, remembrance of Allah, and those who seek knowledge. Gnosis. Here it is from an official, authentic manual yeah. on Islamic jurisprudence. There's your Gnosticism in Islam. Thank you, brother, for the research. Okay. Oh, so, so I'm going to skip over some things now. So, tell me, how much time do we have? What's your cutoff here? Yeah, I'm, 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 I can, I'm free, brother. It's up to you. So.